Peter Schoening is a Danish lawyer specialized in intellectual property rights. I'm happy that you're here. Thank you very much, and I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I will speak to you about copyright authors' rights. First, I will come with some uh, initial remarks uh, regarding the two opponents that we have before us today, the EU and the USA. Who are they in a copyright context? Well, regarding the EU, copyright is deemed more to be a part of the internal market than a part of uh, the cultural policy. This is both good and bad. It's an advantage to look at copyright as not being a part of a cultural policy because then you can make uh, harmonization directives, you can uh, secure rules on uh, common rules on dissemination of uh, cultural products, etc. Um, but it's of course bad to the extent that you don't take into regard cultural policy questions when you uh, make rules on copyright. But we have, to make, we have to be fair and say that to some extent culture is taken into regard when uh, the European Union is uh, harmonizing uh, copyright in its directives. But the whole framework for the European Union in, in uh, trade agreements is not culture, it's the internal market and the European Commission has a special mandate uh, to negotiate with other countries uh, regarding intellectual property in these trade agreements. We also had uh, a few weeks ago a, a new general policy paper from the European Commission on the relationship uh, with third countries uh, regarding uh, the intellectual property rights. Uh, but there are no really clear mentions about uh, the, the issues and how to deal with copyright, etc. in, for instance, the TTIP. Something I, I need to say regarding uh, EU and copyright is that it is extremely worrying that the coming president of the European Commission, uh, Mr. Juncker, uh, has made uh, some public, uh, public announcements where he states that he sees copyright and author's rights as a barrier to the digital innovation and, and growth, uh, because we all know here that this is not the case. It's the opposite way around, that copyright and author's rights are a tool, a motor, for promoting the innovation and growth, both in the digital, digital world and analog world. Don't get me started on this, but uh, we uh, need to we need to look at the other party in these negotiations, the United States of America. Our friends over there are very keen on international protection and enforcement. And I know that many, many countries fear to be put on a list where it's only the international terror organization list that is feared more. That's the 301 watch list. This is the list of countries that the United States believe does not fulfill a good trade policy and does not do uh, its utmost to protect intellectual property. It's self-evident that uh, China is on that list on a yearly basis. Some years ago Sweden was on the list because Sweden was the home basis of the Pirate Bay. The Pirate Bay still exists, but Sweden is off the list. Congratulations. <laughs> but when we look at the US homeland, I believe that there is some room for improvement. And that is notably the case when we look at the question of the protection of the authors and the artists. Because I think many of you know that we have two systems in the world about copyright. 
The one is the, the, the Anglo-Saxon copyright system, which uh, very much focused on the protection of, of, of the industry and, 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 and producers. And we have then the continental European system of, of uh, droit d'auteur uh, from the French Revolution and all this uh, protecting the, the human rights, including the human rights of, of authors and performing artists. Uh, and one clear difference is there that culture is not a part of the American copyright way. And we see that in a lot of aspects. We see it, for instance, in the fact that the United States has not created a system of a general remuneration right for uh, musicians and other uh, artists, uh, the performers, regarding uh, public performance of, of music in, 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 in radio broadcast, etc. They have it in a narrow scope, but not a general right as we know it in all European countries. Regarding the songwriters, we have an example uh, that uh, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, many years ago had a case regarding the US copyrights law which, which had and, and has an exception regarding the use of music in, in small restaurants, the so-called Aiken exception. And there the result of, of the decision in WTO panel was that the United States violated its obligations uh, according to the so-called TRIPS agreement in WTO. The result, of, the result of this is not that the United States has amended its, uh, its uh, copyright law, but that now uh, the United States in more than 10 years have paid a compensation fee to European authors because they do not feel, fulfill these obligations vis-a-vis uh, songwriters and composers. And it's not by accident that the American artist Richard Serra has made a great and beautiful painting entitled The US Government Deprived Deprive Artists Their Moral Rights. That's the title. Moral rights, the protection of the integrity of literary and artistic works are fundamental parts of, of the Berne Convention, but even though the United States have never really implemented the moral rights in its copyright law, to some extent regarding visual art, but only to a small extent, and not in all other categories of art. So these are the words about our two opponents in these TTIP negotiations. Is it the first time that uh, copyright will be included in a free trade agreement? No, this, not, this will not be the first time. We have seen it many times when the EU is uh, negotiating and, and completing uh, free trade agreements with other countries. We saw it in a free trade agreement with uh, South Korea uh, in uh, 2011, where there were some, I think, very good features uh, about uh, both uh, securing the, this right of pu public performance, as I mentioned, uh, for, for performers. Uh, there was a rule about the uh, exchange and cooperation uh, among the um, collective uh, copyright organizations, which is, of course, in practical terms, very important. And there was also mentioned a goal that Korea should introduce a resale uh, uh, right for visual artists, the resale right is uh, the droit de suite, what we in Denmark call the uh, the right to get some royalty when, when uh, works of visual art are, are resold by auctions and galleries, etc. The wording is that uh, Korea should review the de desirability and feasibility of introducing such a resale right. So I think it was quite good. But we always have to be vigilant when trade and intellectual property rights are melded together in international negotiations. History has learned, of that, has learned us that lesson. A country like this one, the sunny Denmark, <laughs> you were not here in the weekend, so <laughs> it was a lot of rain, but now it's sunshiny. But we, are, we not only have, have sunshine, we also have a lot of pigs. We have much more pigs than we have human beings, and much more pigs than we have artists. And the result of that calculation is that there's a tendency in Danish international trade policy 
that we are more keen on the possibility of exportation of bacon than of possibility of fair remuneration to artists. That's a matter of fact. But this is not the only country where that kind of, of uh, hierarchy in, in uh, solutions is found. We have seen the clash between the, the trade policy and the cultural policy a number of times. We saw it, for instance, uh, as also mentioned uh, by Sigolin uh, Bunel in the uh, WTO TRIPS negotiations in the beginning of the 1990s. I remember there were two final issues that had to be negotiated there. One of them was the, the French aid to the aircraft industry, and the other one was copyright funds. So what is the, the general U.S. position when it comes to, to uh, intellectual property, to copyright, and trade agreements? We know that because we have seen it a lot of times. We saw it in the TRIPS agreement, and in the end of the 90s, we saw it also in the other agreement that was that mentioned earlier, the, the MAI, the Multilateral Agreement on Investment, in the auspices of OECD, one of the many uh, abbreviations here this afternoon. In both instances, the United States had a clear policy, a clear wish to have a principle of full national treatment in the trade agreement. Full national treatment sounds uh, very good and, and something that everybody could not do. But the, the effect of full national treatment is that, that the protection that you have, for instance, in Europe, where we give uh, remuneration rights, uh, for instance, as I said, to, to the public performance uh, uh, in, in, in radio and other instances, you will, give, you will provide United, U.S. rights holders exactly the same right to be a part of that remuneration and uh, to receive that remuneration without providing an obligation on the United States to introduce a similar remuneration system. And that is not only the question of uh, the performing artists and uh, their right to remuneration in, in broadcasts. Uh, we also know it uh, from the uh, private copying remuneration schemes. Um, uh, and we know it, and here we talk uh, worst case scenario uh, if that should be the case, but it has been mentioned from time to time. It's the question of being obligated also to, to uh, share, uh, share, share remuneration with uh, US rights holders regarding public lending right. That is what we in Denmark call Bill 6 Aukgift and in Sweden Bill 6 Ersetning. That would be the real demon if the result of such a, a full national treatment would be that there would be an obligation on European countries to, to pay on an equal footing to US rights holders as well as, as European rights holders. I believe that when we talk about copyright in, in uh, free trade uh, agreements, we don't have to, to worry about some major deliberations of, of a principal nature, but we rather have to, to look at the concrete results. I believe that we should secure to, to improve exchange of works, etc. have a cooperation, more cooperation. We should try to improve the protection, but we should ve be very hesitant when it comes to selling out of our assets. So therefore, I believe there are no principal problems. It, believe, it, it depends on the content that we have before us. But even though that, that uh, we have seen a number of times that uh, copyright is included in, in uh, free trade agreements, why now and why in the TTIP? The most important reason is that ACTA didn't fly in Europe. There has been a reference to ACTA uh, sometimes this uh, afternoon, uh, the anti-counterfeiting the anti uh, treaty. 
which was uh, negotiated for a number of years, but where, as Tadia said, uh, the European Parliament uh, said no to European ratification of, the, of this uh, agreement. The European politicians were given the impression that uh, by, by the so-called activists that this new treaty, this new agreement, would mean a lot of new things uh, regarding digital rights, uh, new rules would, uh, would be introduced in, in Europe, which would also be against uh, a, a lot of and a number of, of basic human rights. The truth is that that was not the case. But the problem was that, as, as we have here also, secret negotiations, hidden documents, and emergent conspiracy theories. Rumors killed actor, not facts. The whole purpose of, of uh, this draft treaty of actor was to improve the copyright and, and other intellectual property rights in third countries and not to change or supplement anything in any kind of way uh, the EU rules. But we didn't get ACTA, so we, when we didn't get this multilateral agreement, we have to uh, try to do the same in bilateral agreements. I believe very much in the multilateral agreements. They're the best system for the reciprocal uh, protection of uh, copyright, etc. Uh, many, many years ago, in the mid 19th century, we didn't have international copyright conventions, but we had a lot of individual contracts and agreements between the US and Sweden and Denmark and Sweden, etc. A network of bilateral agreements that didn't function. Ask Dickens, ask Hans Christian Andersen. It didn't function. They didn't get any kind of payment when their works were, uh, were used by uh, third countries, by publishers in, in third countries. But if we can't have new multilateral agreements, for instance, in WIPO, mm -hmm. in, the US, mm -hmm. in the UN Agency for, for Copyright and Intellectual Properties, well then, the second best solution is to have it in new bilateral trade agreements. What do we know about the actual negotiations taking place uh, in TTIP, not much. The negotiations are as contested and secret as it was with, with ACTA. And I believe, and I will, will echo what uh, Tata Kumpa said, we need to have more transparency or glasnost in these negotiations. And I don't buy the argument that it's not possible to have, uh, to have these this negotiations in in the open. Of course you cannot have the actual negotiations in an open room, but the very papers that you discuss have to be put on the open. For instance, the, as I said, the WIPO, the UN Agency for, for Copyright, when there are new treaties and conventions, then everybody knows what document is, been, is, is discussed. And when the European Union uh, has a proposal, it's proposed in the open. You can go to the WIPO website. Everybody can see that Peru has uh, proposed this, EU this, and US that. It's very much in the open. But of course, when it then goes down to making some compromises, that is not on television. That, of, that of course, is an open room. But we need to look at the papers in order both to have transparency and democracy, and also to have a kind of a possible uh, influence from the interested circles. That's what we call democracy. And we need that, and I think we should echo that. Because we risk also to have the, the same as with ACTA, that there's a lot of uh, rumors, there's a lot of uh, con conspiracy theories, and that will uh, be bad for everybody, and not least for a person like my friend Mon Jensen. But we know something. We know from a leaked EU document, yeah, and beside, 
leaked EU document. Yes, isn't there a theory that maybe the United States knows very well the EU position? Hasn't uh, the US had a lot of spies out there, NSA? They know everything about the, the EU, EU position, and when they do that, why on earth not make it public? Okay, don't quote me for that. Um, <laughs> But we know something, and that's from a leaked document that was leaked uh, in March this year. It doesn't say much, but it's what we got. There are three issues that uh, EU has uh, promoted in the negotiations on the TTIP in the copyright area. Retail rights, public performance rights, and broadcast. The broadcasting rights is not so important in, in, in practical terms, but the other two are. The resale right sounds very good because it could mean that the EU is trying to convince the United States that they should introduce this uh, droit de suite uh, for uh, the resale of, of, of visual art in the United States, as we know it in, in Europe and in other, uh, as many other countries. Etsy. It's the obligation of the EU to, to, to propose that because it's following from, uh, it follows from an EU directive on resale right that uh, EU should try to, to export that idea to all third countries. And the US actually has, on the short logo, has had such a right, but only in one of the 50 states in California, and that's not good enough. Also, the rest of the 49 should have a resale right. But maybe from a practical point, uh, even more important, the public performance rights. The problem is we don't know what it means when the, when the EU has put that issue on the agenda. We could hope that it means that the EU is fighting for trying to convince the United States that uh, the US also should introduce such a, a, a general right for uh, not only a not only American, but also European performers, when they are sound recordings are, are used for broadcast, etc., in the United States. We could hope. But on the other side, there's also a risk that the EU here is opening for the question of full national treatment, which would be the gateway for US rights holders, US to get remuneration out of, of uh, Europe without having the same obligations. My last question would be, what should we try to achieve from a copyright, from an author's rights point of view in these TTIP negotiations? Of course, the most important question for all rights holders is a well-functioning market and fair remuneration to authors and performing artists. We should try to fight for that basic principle. But also, I believe that we should try to fight for something else. I think time is ripe for Europe to demand that the United States is fulfilling its international, its international obligations regarding moral rights. The, U, the US government is depriving European creators their moral rights. Moral rights were kept out of the TRIPS agreement because it was deemed by somebody, for instance the United States, that moral rights are not trade-related. The TRIPS, of course, as the name, name suggests, is only trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. But I think it would be fair to question that assessment. I believe that moral rights, as well as any, as any other part of the, of the copyright, is trade-related, and I believe that a level playing field on the markets include also that not only the EU, but also the US implement a reciprocal, obliga reciprocal obligation to, to respect moral rights of the creators. And therefore, moral rights in the US, please. Thank you. <laughs>